Derek Pollard was born in Flint, and he moved with his family to Kalamazoo. Uh, he attended school there, and at the uh, uh, Loy Norix High School, he collaborated with Derek Henderson uh, to form the, the Blue Knight Press. They also uh, did uh, magazines. Uh, in uh, uh, in Kalamazoo, he collaborated with Herb Scott at the New Issues Press, lived in Ann Arbor, and attended the University of Michigan, which he left in 1992, uh, as he says, to travel in place of my studies. Uh, so this is where his peregrinations uh, began. Uh, he uh, lived in the Manhattan and Hermosa beaches in California, uh, in San Francisco, Austin, Texas, Minneapolis, Red Bank, New Jersey, Syracuse, uh, and then Las Vegas. Uh, and um, uh, he's told us tonight where he is now, and frankly, I forgot what he said. Uh, he's, a, he's a poet of peregrinations. Uh, he's wandered. He wandered and lived for three years with the installation artist uh, Samara Golden. Uh, and by the way, she's uh, uh, quite quite a bit of, of notice uh, in New York with a with an installation uh, uh, last year there, and then took it to to Australia. In 1995, Derek collaborated with uh, Derek Henderson uh, on. Uh, in Consequentia. Uh, it took them about a dozen years to finish and 16 years to publish. Uh, they, uh, uh, they, they viewed this collaboration as, as uh, uh, in, a, in an unusual way. Uh, he, he, he says that early on, they were captivated by the collaborations between William S. Burroughs and, and Brian uh, Geising and by the cut-up method that Burroughs made an integral part of his writing process, that unstitching of individual poems based on our own interests. And at the time, they were uh, alchemy, magic, mathematics, the number of language. And these became the guiding architecture for the project. Uh, once they, uh, and uh, he, he uh, says that, that, uh, uh, they they reworked these poems so much that it, it became hard to, to remember uh, which person originated them and and uh, where, where the identity was. It was basically uh, a, a a joint collaboration. And, uh, an editor then uh, made further additions. Uh, this whole process is described in a, a very good interview uh, on the website of Connotations Press, uh, an online an online artifact. Uh, it's it's a, a magazine that is no longer active, but the website is still up. I encourage you to uh, uh, to look at it if you're interested in the process. So uh, Derek finished his, his bachelor's degree uh, at Kalamazoo, that is in uh, at Western Michigan University. Then he got an uh, MFA at the University of Utah. Uh, he relocated to Las Vegas to complete his PhD at the University of Nevada. Uh, um, um, Las Vegas. Uh, he's taught at many schools in the places where he has lived, and he's also uh, uh, editing the uh, Poets uh, on Poetry series started by Donald Hall at the University of Michigan Press. I hope he'll be telling us some more about that uh, project. Uh, please welcome uh, uh, Derek Pollard. Uh, Ed, thank you so much. That is a biography, most of which I'd forgotten myself. So I hope that shows up on Wikipedia at some point soon. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate uh, the warm introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's wonderful to see some familiar faces and names. Uh, and I, I'm really honored. Uh, as I mentioned before we began the event this evening, uh, I miss Michigan. Uh, Terry, you had mentioned something along those same lines. It's been even longer for me since I've been back. And um, I really look forward to to getting back to, to my native soil, uh, getting back to the old haunts and being able to embrace 
the people and places that have been so formative for me. Um, Ed, you had mentioned the great good fortune I had earlier in working with Herb Scott um, toward the end of Herb's life. This was after he had established new issues uh, and it had uh, begun its meteoric rise as, as one of the leading presses in the country. And I, I was able to spend a number of years uh, under Herb's tutelage learning about uh, the ins and outs of literary editing and publishing. And uh, I will always be grateful that that towering man uh, brought me into his life and uh, gave me so many opportunities and opened so many doors. And it's with that in mind that I would like to begin with a poem of Herb's. Uh, this was originally published in, in uh, um, uh, well, you'll find it in, on Verse Daily online. Uh, it's simply entitled Poem, and it's dedicated to Herb's wife, Shirley. Poem, isn't it here in the unnamed giving of light? Bodies of earth and water lifted and taken into the orbit of flesh. Isn't it the waking of blood and bone to another earthly presence moving across the space of a lighted window as though it were the universe? Isn't it the breaking that sets free the commingling of sane and insane fragments? Moments when the light burns through to the meek suspension of air. Now I will say as gorgeous as Herb's work is and will always remain, uh, some of my fondest memories are of that man's laughter. He had one of the most gorgeous encompassing laughs that you could imagine. And I remember at one point he was in the habit of, of getting into the office at like six in the morning. Um, and so toward the end of my run, before I moved out to Salt Lake City to begin my MFA, uh, I made it a point of trying to beat him into the office as often as I could. And so I'd be there at like 530 in the morning with the lights off doing a little bit of work so that Herb wouldn't know I was there. And he would pop in, I'd hear the keys in the door, and he would see me and just start laughing like a child. It was the most wonderful thing you could imagine. So that was how Herb and I spent our last summer together before I moved on. And uh, thankfully, we had a, a, the great good fortune to stay in touch. And if I remember correctly, one of the last times that we saw one another in person was out at AWP in Vancouver. Um, and I was able to give him a, a hug. It had been a minute. I was out in Salt Lake City at that point. Um, I miss him very dearly. I know, Terry, you had mentioned um, this was the anniversary of your father's passing. Um, I miss her dearly, um, but he's also so close. Um, and so I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'd like to, to uh, move on to a poem written when I first moved down to Florida uh, from Las Vegas. I lived with my aunt for six months. And at the time, both of my paternal grandparents were still alive, and that's what brought me back. I wanted to be available to help with caregiving and spend time with them. Uh, my grandmother was uh, severely demented at the time, and so for all intents and purposes, we had lost her, but it was comforting to be a presence. Um, and my grandfather was still in fine fettle at the age of, I think it was 96 when I moved back. My grandmother passed away at 97, uh, my grandfather Thad at 99. This was a poem that I wrote while living in the house my aunt had taken over after my grandparents had moved into an assisted living facility. It's entitled Hallelujah, and it's for Noel Andre, who was our neighbor in that house since I was a boy. Hallelujah. The dogs at the kennel whine and scratch against the palms scissoring, against the crick separating the house from the cars, hurrying heedless toward the gulf or toward the bay, against the tent and detritus of the homeless who in their dull days long revel have settled a place for themselves behind the shell station, the glare of its stadium lights beginning to flicker, to flicker, and to give way to mourning. Such is our freedom, joy measured, 
joy withheld. I am at war with nothing. Every wine, a declaration, every leaving of grass, bruised by the sun, a cosmos newly made. Somewhere, the final victory, the most meaningless of all. In its place, Noel ambling down his driveway before sunrise, a neighbor's call, a neighbor's response. Sunrise, the hallelujah, we are only too pleased to leave unsung. No one is at war. We turn away no company. Every bark we hear sounds a wild ceremony. This next poem is entitled Field Without End. From the coin before the threshold, tarnished from your mother's travels, which before weighed dull and heavy in your tender hand, springs forth Blake's heavenly host, dried flower, which you asking of me to stop my sight and stay, resting in the blindness you have commanded, go to precisely and take from its setting. Unfurls a field that knows no horizon. Take heed those with thoughts of trespass. Here is no entry. Here a girl has made of herself her own sanctuary. Everywhere Croatoan. Our salvation bound to the carving, to what others call mystery because what they hear when the coin touches the floorboard and we raise our fingers from the flower is altogether other than the voice urging us to pursue the hill too steep for the city, the loss too close for the grieving, the desire too wild for the loving. The girl who stands before us decides her name, field without end. And whenever she comes among us, she is a revel of angels dancing in the sun. This next poem uh, was written after I returned from a walk. I really astonishingly, even now, three years in, I, I live a block and a half from the intercoastal in West Palm Beach, Florida. And when it's not a thousand degrees outside for like the two weeks in which that's the case in mid-February, I make a point of getting out and I, I try to get by the water as often as I can. Having lived in the desert for five years, um, I craved it and it has always been very dear and close to me. So this is a poem entitled Come Another Year, and it was written after one of those walks along the intercoastal. Hurried by desire, hurried by an urgency, it knows so deeply it is the urgency. The gecko scuttles into the plastic bottle left lying on the sidewalk, thin edge of blue, all that remains against the paper's white tear. Women run or they walk along the intercoastal, men promenade shirtless, seeming without care. The same couple as two days before, seated yards apart, taught with music, taught with the rhythm of the day, lean fishing poles into the water, flicking light against a sky freighted with gray. Someone passes, saying something familiar in a language we used to know is the language of prayer. A man and a woman, young and unafraid, guide their dog to the sidewalk and begin walking north toward that place, heaped now with ash and cinder, where once we loved, in a sun we would never know, where a girl calling herself field without end has come another year closer to shedding the swaddling that has been wrapped tightly, ever so tightly around her, 
starving her of song. Among the midden, it is clear. There is no nature other than what we make. And what we make is low and lowly, a jangle and a discord, a blight that brings the crows to the pine, the vultures to the circle, the oil to the surface of the rain. This next poem is entitled Safety Harbor. Um, it was written when my sister and brother-in-law were living in the town of Safety Harbor here in Florida. They've since moved up to Tarpon Springs. Um, I was just able to have dinner with them a couple of nights ago. Uh, this is no great surprise to any of you, I know, but uh, as I have grown older and wearier and more road weary, um, Family's always been at the center of my life. It's become increasingly important, um, particularly in the face of loss. It's poem, Safety Harbor. The great egret stands with one leg folded to its body among the St. Augustine grass, its neck a bob with breeze and out of plume. Where the neighbor's foxtail palm stood before our last hurricane, her beagle circles, nosing the dark gray earth, willing even now the two months absence away. The crick is the crick I have known since a child, running behind the only house we have not yet lost to memory. The traffic sounds the lanes of West Bay Drive just before we no longer need turn on any light to make our way from room to room. In Safety Harbor, my brother-in-law stirs, my sister beside him. What they share between them is theirs, alone. And yet, we all claim it as our own. Love is no cup filled with irradiated fluids, no splintered cell broken within us and spreading, spreading each day and each night of dream. My brother-in-law stirs, my sister beside him, and we are all powerless to love so deeply as to forget. Grant us, great egret, your gangly majesty. For us, no heaven on the wing. What then must it be? The earth, dark, gray, encircled, estranged? In this, we sound the morning, a bilge of crick these sudden bright veins collapsing each womb of us entirely. Let us rise unburdened and unblighted. Give us this grace, just as we desire it, just as it calls to us, one and all, equally lost in the loss we cannot recover. The only loss that robs us of our ardor for that which we cannot still, for that which stays in us a wilderness, new, always. This final poem, um, Flint, Kalamazoo, Ann Arbor are always going to be home to me. But over the many years of my never ending tour, um, and again, I don't think this will surprise any of you. New York City is, has become my adoptive home. Um, it's the place I feel most alive and the place I feel interestingly and, and perhaps ironically most at home in. This is a poem written out of my love for the city. And um, it's a very quiet memorial. It's entitled Manhattan Still. The way the trees are and you, sitting in that booth in the Emerald Inn, away from the traffic and the kids, still in the middle of all that noise, the booth hard as sunlight and the light itself. I felt like swinging from my own heart. The way the streets tilted up, the buildings before the buildings were no longer there, how it was 
just then, that evening, you with that bottle in your hand, that glass of Vonier, and the buildings are still there, even though they're gone. I truly appreciate the opportunity to read with you, Terry, tonight. Um, and I am very much looking forward to all of the readings that are still ahead. Thank you to everyone at Crazy Wisdom for making this possible and for continuing to keep the, these virtual doors open so that we can share in evenings like this together from all of the points on the compass. I'm deeply appreciative of that. Thank you.